My name is AJ Bushy, and I'm in the communications department here at BTI. And for this month's Breaking Ground, I'm really excited. Uh, we welcome Delaney Sickler, BTI's Education and Outreach Director, who will be talking about BTI's Summer Research Experience Program for undergrads. It's also called a REU program. And we're really lucky. We also welcome this month, uh, Kaylin Raley and Sadhvi Mohan Kumar, two former undergrads who experienced the program. So we'll be able to hear directly from them about their experiences uh, here at BTI. So hi, Delaney, Kaylin, and Sadhvi. Welcome. And uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping announcements for those of you who haven't joined us before. Um, all the attendees out there in Zoom world will be muted, uh, but you can ask questions in the little chat box. And so for the first half hour or so, we'll do um, a discussion. And for this particular one, we'll be talking with Delaney first um, for about 15 minutes or so probably, and then we'll bring in Kaylin and Savi to talk to them about uh, their experiences. And you can ask uh, questions in the chat. And then after about a half hour, we'll have about a half hour of Q&A. And uh, I've also enabled a live transcript function. So you should be seeing closed captions at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to turn that off, you can do it with the, uh, there's a little live transcript button down there at the bottom. And uh, thank you all again out there for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And so I think we'll now kick things off with Delaney. And um, we will welcome Kaylin and Sabi back in about 15 minutes. And um, so Delaney, uh, I just want to say how much I love this program. Um, you know, it, it really, you know, the interns bring so much energy into the Institute in the summer. It's really great. It's such a, like an infusion of energy. Um, so I was hoping, you know, you could just kind of tell us some of the, the nuts and bolts about the program for those who don't know about it. Sure, sure. Hi, AJ. Um, it's great to be here this afternoon. And thanks for all of the um, all of our attendees for joining us to learn about this program. Uh, so the, the Boyce Thompson Institute has been hosting students in research labs in our Ithaca location for over 20 years. Um, but even before this, before we were here in Ithaca, we had interns in the original Boyce Thompson Institute back in the 1970s. Um, when it was in Yonkers. And so there's a long tradition really of training and inspiring students for careers in plant science that is well supported by um, our institute and by the researchers here. So this, this program that we're gonna be talking about is funded very well by the National Science Foundation and the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, George Jander, who is a faculty member here at at BTI um, is the principal investigator for these awards. And he, is, uh, he also has a co-PI Margaret Frank at Cornell and a co-PI Scott McArt who um, supports these programs. The, these site, RU site programs um, that are funded uh, are for around 28 to 35 students, 25 to 30 students, undergrads um, every year. and that they come for about 10 weeks in the summer. They are from all over the country uh, and, and US territories. Um, and they are here and placed in Cornell University labs with the school uh, faculty with the School of Integrated Plant Science, BTI labs, um, as well as the USDA Holly Center. So it's really a community effort with all of these labs hosting students focused on plant science spanning from plant molecular biology to bioinformatics and ecology. Um, and we also have, you know, a really important part of this program is our mentors who help these students with hypothesis-driven research. They are coming to do hands-on real-world science. They come and they write a proposal. They're reviewing scientific literature. They're developing experiments in conjunction with their mentors. And then at the end of the summer, they're presenting their results. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I love about it is um, even the students who are in Cornell Labs or in the USDA Labs over at the Holly Center, they're, they're still coming in the building pretty often. Like, what what is going on there? Yeah, yeah, no, they, exactly. So we have a strong professional development um, aspect to this program. This is a really cohort-driven uh, program, at, and the idea is that we have this 
group of 30 or so students that come together. They, and they get to have these new experiences together um, and they get to make lasting, build lasting relationships, not only amongst themselves, but also amongst the, um, the mentors here in our community. And part of that professional development are weekly seminars um, ranging from, with faculty, ranging from all the different areas of plant science. So they're really learning about the diversity of research that they could study. And we're also presenting them with graduate school panels and seminars to prepare them uh, eventually to go on to get a PhD. There are mentor programs available for them, uh, career workshops, and also some science communication development. So there's activities happening all the time, a bioinformatics workshop, you know, it's a full summer schedule, certainly. Yeah, and that that's always, I think, an important thing is that, uh, you know, these, these interns are exposed to not just the academic side of things, but also people who are in industry and also like communications like me. Um, so that's really a, a nice thing about it. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the other things that when I hear the term summer intern, I think like most people, you kind of think of, oh, they're just getting coffee or making copies or, you know, run out right. of nuts or something. Um, but this is very different. Can you tell us how this is, how this is unique and different? Yeah, of course, of course. So, you know, we like to see these students as visiting scholars. They're here to be mentored and become part of the lab. You know, whether they've done research in the past or many of them come and have not spent this much time doing research at all, especially for 10 weeks, 40 hours a week. So it's important that they're able to provide their perspective and their, their curiosity with each of these projects. Um, and so the lab really, you know, likes to cultivate a sense of feeling like they belong in the space. Um, and while they could end up doing some repetitive lab protocol on um, certain days and certain periods of time, you would never find them filing paper or getting coffee for anyone. They're really here to do hands-on research and in, are involved in meaningful ways. Uh, you know, when we think about what that research looks like, there are multiple programs included in our site, and that includes bioinformatics and computation. We also have plant genome research, plant genetics, biochemistry, um, and ecology. So we're, we're looking at a, a broad range of plant science and, and, and projects that students can participate in. And we also have some new projects this summer, which I'm really excited about, because it will be pairing undergraduate students with a plant-focused lab and They'll also be with an engineering lab for a transdisciplinary experience through our Center for Programmable Plants at Cornell. And they're really looking at how plants communicate uh, with each other and possibly with us, with us as humans. Um, and then, you know, speaking about communication, uh, I talked about this symposium and the students presenting their research at the end of the summer but we do run a full scientific research symposium each year, um, this George and Helen Kohut Symposium. And students at the end of their experience are asked to create a scientific poster or a presentation that really talks about their product project in depth. And it's just a, a great way to present their outcomes and all of that they've done this summer. And yeah, then, that's always so it's always so impressive that you know they're they're not just learning how to pipette and things they're actually yeah. coming up with with a hypothesis and designing studies and conducting the research and then and presenting their findings it's really impressive and you know I think I think it is it is very impressive but it couldn't be done none of the students I think would say that they did this on their own. You know, a, a really important aspect to the program is this mentor driven approach. Um, and each participant is paired with at least one mentor in the lab, whether that's a graduate student, a postdoc, a faculty member. And those mentors are working with them on a daily basis because some students arrive with with zero research experience. And this is the first time they're in a lab. Um, or maybe other students arrive with 
some lab experience, but this is the first time they're in a plant science lab or in this type of environment. So these mentors are really there, you know, working with them, helping them to develop their proposal and training in both technical and transferable skills. So I just, you know, we couldn't really do it without these graduate students and postdocs and the success of the program really reflects the strength and capacity of our mentoring. It really is a, a community effort. It's really it is. cool to see in the summer. I, uh, I really love it here in the summer. Um, and how do you measure success? Yeah, so, you know, at the end of the, during the program and at the end of the program, we have, we have surveys, obviously, and some highlights that we typically, you know, see from the students and we like to measure um, are gains in their confidence and specifically their ability to do research and their confidence and their ability to contribute to science. Um, so those are huge gains for the participants, as well as an understanding of what everyday research is like and what it is really like to work in the lab. So we're really trying to increase participants' um, identity as early career scientists and sense of belonging in the field, and also their self-efficacy through this program. And we, we did a, some analysis for a, a renewal and our program outcomes over the past 10 years that include around 190 students, we um, found that around 80% of them go on to attend some, uh, some additional schooling, specifically graduate school. And then 70% of them end up in STEM careers. Uh, a lot of them work as lab technicians after graduating from college. Um, you know, three or four years after the REU program. And then most of our former alumni in the program are active in research and collectively have reported 100 and, or 417 publications. Um, and then alumni reported 81 presentations at society meetings and 135 prizes, grants, or other recognition for their work within three years of completing the program. So we've seen some really great outcomes from our participants and our alumni, and we love to stay engaged and connected with the folks that have been through this program. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, before we move on to Kaelin and Sabi, uh, can we talk a little, about, a little bit about kind of a bigger picture? You know, why, why is this important? It's not just making scientists, right? There's, you know, why, why is this program important? Right, right. And so the, our funders, um, really want to see some outcomes from, from these REU programs. And we really focus on recruiting students who normally wouldn't have this type of opportunity, um, who may be from small colleges or from universities that just don't have a heavy focus on research. We also really want to include and recruit for first-generation college students and students who identify as traditionally underrepresented in STEM. And so if, oh, if we go to the next slide, um, that, is, that is one of the areas that, that NSF is looking for us to recruit. But also from a plant science perspective, um, we are just kind of lagging behind a little bit from our biomedical, the PhDs awarded in biomedical sciences. And so the number of PhDs um, has remained relatively flat and consistent over the last 20 year, years when we're looking at both basic and applied plant science. Um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that plant and agricultural fields are going to be seeing a significant growth in job opportunities. But we're lagging behind enticing and inspiring students to get into this type of research. And this program really uh, wants us to support students whose career path aligns potentially with graduate school. And so this is you know, one way we can hopefully get more uh, plant scientists into the field um, because we need plant scientists. We have a lot of challenging, loom looming challenges. Um, I don't think anyone could disagree that we're facing environmental challenges and agricultural challenges. And we need to have individuals working on these problems, whether they are getting PhDs or not, just working in this field. And, you know, I think 
the other piece of this is having full participation um, of our population in this country. And right now we are not seeing full participation um, and that's what we really wanna get to. And so we are actually seeing underrepresentation from traditionally excluded populations. Um, and it's being, it's more acute in the plant sciences than in other fields. So here we have a, a pie chart of our US population. Um, this is obviously even gonna change in the next five years to have a lot more um, diversity of backgrounds and populations. But what we're seeing is even compared to the life sciences, the plant sciences are falling behind um, in their ability to attract and retain some of these populations. Mm. So the, you know, I'm re referencing a paper um, from data by Nadzima and Macintosh. And if you'd like to scan the QR code, you can uh, read the paper on your own. And then lastly, you know, this is, this is all really important, but at the end of the day, if our interns and if the students that we engage with don't go into a PhD and don't go into plant science um, research, it is really important that the knowledge that they gain in this program will help them wherever they end up working because increasing plant awareness in the world in whatever field you're in is, is always a mission of our program and a mission of BTI. Yeah, that, the, this concept of increasing plant awareness is is a pretty interesting one and something we definitely want to help with. So yeah, I, I like that concept. Even I, you, you know, you show the stats: eighty percent roughly go on and become PhDs, but even the other twenty percent, it's it's still great that they've done the program and care that's knowledge about plant science with them. That's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Delaney. Let's try moving to uh, Kaelin and Savi and hearing uh, some firsthand experiences about, about uh, their experiences with the program. Uh, so Kaelin, um, let's start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and your experience? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so I'm Kaelin. I am a second year PhD student in plant biology here at Cornell. Um, and I'm currently working in Angie Nelson's lab here at BTI. Um, yeah, so my first experience with BTI was in the summer of 2019, where I was an RU intern, and I worked in Wojtek Pulaski's lab um, studying recombination. Um, and it was a really great experience because I uh, did a RU at the University of Oregon before, and um, it was a great experience and being able to uh, be with other students and other peers that were interested in science, but I think that the RU at BTI really helped me gain an understanding of what life was like as a researcher or as a scientist on a daily basis. Um, and it was um, probably one of the first times that I experienced like true independence uh, with the project um, and working alongside with the postdoc that was my mentor. Um, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed the experience. I I have to say, I think that 2019, the cohort was absolutely amazing. I'm still in, uh, staying in contact with some of my peers. Um, and this is before COVID, but um, we had this awesome experience being able to live in the dorms and we cooked food together, but, and then we also were able to share um, and conversation and about our experiences in the lab, but we also were able to leave campus and we took some weekend trips to New York City, to Toronto, um, and to even to like surrounding like local areas um, to explore some of the really great uh, scenery. Because I, I always say Ithaca in the summer is really charming. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's nice. So, so you decided to come back after you graduated. I did. I yeah. did. I, I looked into other PhD programs and uh, even in different disciplines. And I was really just drawn back to Ithaca and Cornell to um, study long and encoding RNAs in um, Dr. Nelson's lab. What did you think of the uh, like the professional development type workshops um, that Delaney mentioned? Absolutely. Um, I really enjoyed them. I had some experience with bioinformatics before the um, internship, 
but it really piqued my interest and inspired me to, or motivated me to take even more courses at my home institution at that time, um, because I just wanted to gain a deeper understanding. But I also, it was really interesting too, because a lot of the interns had different levels or experience with the bioinformatics and some of the professional development workshops. So being able to sit in a room with other people, um, we were not only being able to learn from our instructors, but also from our peers. And we also had food after, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's, uh, that isn't, I gotta be honest, that's not something I, I really think about. You know, you think, when I think about the program, I think about, you know, the mentors and the PIs, but learning from your, your fellow undergrads, that sounds really valuable as well. Mm -hmm. And so you were not just a mentee, correct? You've also been a mentor now. Can yeah. <laughs> yes, I had the experience or the opportunity to be a mentor this past summer. So for the um, internship in 2021. Um, and it was really interesting to experience both sides of the program um, and how much of thought and um, like energy goes into being a, a mentor and I love doing it. I was just ending my first year in my PhD program. So I had so many ideas and it was so awesome to have a energetic and excited intern to like bounce ideas off. And ultimately she helped me set up my, my experiments that I've been doing for the past year or so. So oh, that's wonderful. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we um, no, I'm interested to hear what Safi, how uh, their experience was. All right, cool. Okay, uh, Safi, let's move to you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and your experience? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, thanks for having me, um, of course. And my name is Safi, and I'm a currently a junior um, at the College of New Jersey. And um, I did this program last summer, so my summer from sophomore to junior year. So I did actually do this after, you know, the pandemic had started. So I guess I could talk a little bit more about that if people have questions about it. Um, but basically I got involved with plant science in my freshman year of college with my advisor in my home institution. And he actually had worked in George's lab before at BTI. So he kind of in introduced me and told me about this program. And at the time, because of COVID, there was a lot of limitations in what I could do in my home institution. Um, like the labs were closed, school was closed. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to kind of learn more about research and um, get a better taste of it, more hands-on experience. So when I got there, um, I worked with a mentor uh, who was a postdoc um, and he was great. And I learned a lot, both the lab techniques and like kind of how publishing worked and a lot of other kind of career things um, that you can really gain from a program like this. And um, Specifically, what I worked on was VIGS, which is virus-induced gene silencing. So I thought it was it was just like a brand new concept to me, but learning how to like manipulate and silence genes was it was like a really cool experience. And now I'm actually setting up that process in my home institution. So it's like it was really cool to be able to learn something. And now I'm currently teaching my peers about it. So it really goes to show like you can learn some really valuable skills in a program like this. Yeah, I think that's amazing that you're able to take what you learned here and bring it back to your undergrad institution. And you're at your College of New Jersey, is that is that right? Yes, that's right. Right, and there's so there's no graduate, there's no graduate school there, or I've, um, there isn't a kind of graduate school set up in the way that it is at Cornell and like with BTI. So there isn't a collaboration directly with undergrad students and graduate students which was kind of a new experience for me when I was at BTI. And I thought that, that it was a great way, kind of how Kellen was saying earlier, there's a lot of like collaboration and learning through peers and graduate students, postdocs, PIs, like the whole group. And at least in my home institution, it's just like my professor and then undergrad, undergrad students. So it was a really um, different experience. Yeah, and you, you mentioned how valuable the mentorship was could you tell could you talk a little bit more about that and um, who who was it and yes sure so my mentor is a postdoc uh sung ho and he was 
I guess, specialized in, in VIGs or that's at least what he was working on when, while I was there. So he like taught me from like the basics with certain lab techniques that I hadn't done before to even more like complicated processes. And there are a lot of like, um, I guess, machines and things available at BTI that weren't at my college because BTI is like a way more specialized, bigger program. So then I was able to use all these machines and learn all these new things from him. And of course, like I, I kind of mentioned, like these mentors aren't just there to teach you these lab processes, but definitely like he was telling me about the stuff he was publishing and how his life was in grad school and that sort of thing. So you kind of develop like more than just um, kind of like a professional relationship. And that, that does seem like an important thing of you kind of learn how to be what it's like to be a scientist, to actually be a scientist. Would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. Very cool. Uh, thank you both. Um, I think maybe we'll bring Delaney back in. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can start putting them in the chat, in the little chat box. Um, and before we get to the questions, uh, Delaney, is there anything else you'd like to add about the BTI summer internships? Sure. Well, you know, the application is open right now for summer 2022. We are planning on hosting students uh, in person. Um, we're recruiting now for, for positions. So if you or anyone that you know may be interested in uh, applying and attending our research experience for undergrads for tw summer 2022, we encourage you to visit our website um, or scan this this QR code um, and take a look at the videos and that application and the information on our site. We also are hosting high school students this summer, local and regional high school students. So if you know of any students that live within the Ithaca region who may want to participate in a program that is really similar to the undergraduate program, it's just much more condensed. It's only six weeks. Um, but the, the structure is really similar where they, they will work with a mentor on a specific project and participate in professional development um, and just gain a lot of first time uh, job skills in this program. Uh, we, uh, we have the, the research program and then each summer we also, this is a, about a two year program. There's a program called Workforce Advantage and that is a program that allows high school students to work in some of the research support centers uh, at BTI. So areas of operation such as uh, IT, procurement, finance, uh, lab services, greenhouse, computational biology and mechanical departments. So you know we want to inspire researchers and also those who are excited about research but want to support it in more of an operational way. Uh, that program will uh, start taking applications a little closer to summer, to the summertime. So we have a variety of programs that can all be found on our website. Um, and you know, we look forward to having a 2022 with a little bit less complications and limitations from COVID. Uh, we're, but we're planning, you know, we'll see how it goes. You know, I never can say for certain how things, what, how things will happen in the future but we are planning for it to be in person but but we can shift to virtual if we need to like we did in 2020 so yeah we didn't really talk about 2020 much but that was entirely virtual and uh yes were so, some things in 2021 virtual is that how it works some were in person some were virtual or it, yes yeah so we did uh, some of our training and our lectures, some of our professional development series via Zoom, by Zoom. And then we shifted, as regulations changed, we shifted to an in-person format. It was much better for cohort building and that peer-to-peer -peer relationship as Kaylin talked about a little bit. Um, so it was nice that we were able to get out of Zoom only and move into some in-person activities. However, the research for the most part was all happening in person last yeah. summer. And we, we hope that's the case this coming summer as well. Great. How was, how was that piece of the 
um, that you experienced some in person and some remote. Did that did that work for you? Um, yeah. So I I believe um, I remember some of our bioinformatics courses were on Zoom initially, and then we kind of had a few in person, um, which was interesting. But you know, I was grateful that we were able to do some of this stuff in person. I think the um, one of the harder parts was towards the end. Um, unfortunately, we had to have our um, our final presentations like um, kind of hybrid, like we weren't allowed to have as many people come in person to see our poster um, presentations. Um, but at the same time, like we were able to kind of adapt and we we're still able to present them and we had like a recording version of them. So I think that the program has kind of, I guess at this point has a good grasp on you know, what to do in case we need to kind of move back to a hybrid model, but hopefully this summer more of that stuff can be in person. And it's I just want to, oh, oh, go I'm ahead, sorry. Dan. I was just going to say, I think, Sadvi, I think you hit on something that made this summer very successful is the adaptability of our, our students and our mentors. Um, everybody just I think was grateful and supportive of any decision that we made because they were happy that they got to be doing research and that we created an environment that was uh, hopefully safe for everyone to be doing research and just appreciate everyone's adaptability for things. You know, we, when we had to switch to the symposium being with less people and, and, and being mostly virtual, everyone was okay with it. And it wasn't too, you know, people just took things very well last summer. And I think as program organizers, we really appreciated the, the attitudes of all of the students and the mentors. Yeah, and I would just chime in and say um, those videos, we, there are videos of, yeah. of everyone's presentations, yeah. including the, um, the posters. I remember Sadi did a poster. And they're all on Facebook. So I just put that link to our Facebook page in there. And if you click on videos, we have a ton of, ton of awesome videos uh, that Mike Carroll, my, my colleague in the comms department makes, um, but they're down there and there. So you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a bunch of, bunch of cool videos from uh, the presentations. Um, okay, let's go out to the Zoom world and, and do some questions. There's a two kind of similar one from Douglas and one from Paul. Do you often get more applications than available positions? And so what's the acceptance rate and how do you choose the interns among all the applications? Sure, I can, I can answer that one. Um, our acceptance rate is around, it varies a little bit, but I'd say last year is around 8%. So yes, we get a lot more um, applicants than we have positions for and the way that we choose them is not just me looking through applications, picking out the ones that I think would be a good fit. It is through a very intensive review panel. We have all of the labs who plan to host students um, have a representative come and be part of this review panel where each application is looked at by at least three to four reviewers. And then those reviewers come together in a panel and discuss um, a set of criteria that we have. And that criteria and that conversation allows us to start to rank applicants based on uh, need and based on backgrounds, interest, experience, um, and looking at what our funders are also looking for for, uh, for our program goals. So it, it's, a, it's a very intensive review process and it takes quite a while actually to get through all the applications. Um, so that, that's how we do it. Yeah, and applications are due, what, February? February 4th. February so. 4th, yeah. Yeah. And then the program starts in June or something, right? So yeah, that's quite a bit of time <laughs> to choose and then, and then get people ready. Right, we like to let students know in early March, early to end of March, if they're accepted into the program so they can start planning yeah. uh, for their arrival in Ithaca. And our program this summer will start May 31st and it will end August 5th. Okay. Great. And um, what feedback, if any, do you get from interns for improvement slash changes in existing programs based on their experience during the summer? That's a good question. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we get feedback all the time through surveys or through conversations. So a lot of um, qualitative feedback and some, it varies each summer, um, but some of the things that we've heard feedback on and were able to implement this summer um, has to do with broadening, broadening the perspective participants and the students mentoring network. So we talk so much about mentoring, right? About building your network, building, building out um, all these different types of mentors and these, these individuals. So mentors for careers, mentors for academic planning, mentors for support, um, just, just general support. And so one of the things that happened this summer was we were able to collaborate with a graduate student Adriana Hernandez, who helped us develop a social mentoring pilot. And this allowed students who wanted to participate in the program an opportunity to be connected with another graduate student outside of their lab and out, sometimes outside of the field of plant science. So graduate students on Cornell campus that were able to hopefully um, share in some ideas identity development and understanding of what it's like to be in graduate school, what it might be like to be not traditionally represented in STEM or coming from an LBGTQ community um, or coming from communities that aren't well represented or well defined in this in, at Cornell and having those conversations with our REU interns. So it was mm -hmm. a really great program. And so that's an example of something we got feedback on and we were able to implement this summer. And we hope to do, we will definitely be doing that program moving forward. That's a great idea. That's really, really wonderful. Um, next question. Do you think the experience with virtual versus in-person programming has more general lessons for life science research going forward as we consider at BTI and other places how hybrid or remote work should fit, fit into our plans? And I guess that's, that could be for all three of you, if anybody has any thoughts on that, since, since we've all lived through it. Um, anyone want to jump at that one? Delaney, what are your thoughts? I, I, can, take, I can take a stab at it. Kaylin, I'd love to hear your, your perspective too. Um, so right now, the way that research, at this moment in time, the way that research is happening, and the way that we are set up in, in, in an institution like BTI in Cornell, I think that you know, in-person programming definitely easier. It definitely allows for people to connect more, um, and it creates an environment that we're maybe used to, right? And and it's easier for our mentors. It's easier for our, for our interns. But as we you know look into the future, I think we're always open to finding creative ways that we can create hybrid learning environments. So whether that be training or professional development that can happen remotely or in Zoom plus, maybe you know expanded on Zoom and not just Zoom because I think we've done a lot of Zooming and we know its capabilities. But I also think there's opportunities to continue to collaborate remotely with research um, and just setting up the infrastructure and setting up the expectations for that will be important. But it's definitely, I don't think we're going backwards. I think we're, we're looking at a future where we need to just be training students to be prepared for, for all types of environments. Yeah, it's, oh, go ahead, Kayla. Uh, I was just going to say that um, I completely agree with Delaney. Um, well, like one of the first, one of my first thoughts was like the SciComm workshop that we had in 2019. Like um, there's just being able to share space with um, peers who are also interested in the same things, but and also having, being able to have an open dialogue with people that know a lot about science communication within labs and also in other spaces where people who aren't as familiar with the, with the science behind um, crops or um, engineering or crop engineering. So, um, but I have to say, I think that this summer, just from the mentor uh, perspective, um, it was really interesting to hear my mentee come back and talk about some of the things that you all 
discussed, even if it was um, via Zoom. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of, I'm interested to hear like how people are able to recapitulate some of the like in-person activities over Zoom and be able to retain the, um, the comfort level and, and the openness that uh, comes along with being in person. Um, I just like kind of wanted to add on to that. Um, I know we had some like, um, I believe like talks, like some of the professors were giving talks and those were hybrid. So people could attend those in person or via Zoom. So I thought that that was like a really kind of nice balance. So kind of alluding to what Kaylin was talking about, sometimes students who preferred to needed to be in person to really retain or pay attention, like they had that option. Or whereas if you're someone who felt more comfortable on Zoom, that was also an option. So I think like, you know, we're learning more as we go, like what works for most students. So I think like for the foreseeable future, like learning to kind of handle this hybrid half online, half in person, is kind of the future we're seeing. Yeah, I think just from like an inclusivity standpoint, having the options is a good thing. Um, but, um, you know, a, a key will be to kind of, you know, for everyone to be honest with themselves, like what's best for me, you know, if, and, and hopefully um, if what's best for you is being in person that you can still go to those lectures in person, even if you're far away, on campus, you know, and, and there's there's not a pressure to kind of watch it at your desk while you're also doing some experiments and only like half paying attention. Um, so that that would, I think, an all of the above answer is is a, is a way to go. But I'm I'm in comms. I'm not <laughs> I'm not a scientist, so I don't really. Know. That's my two cents. Um, okay, next question: Are there any areas within the current program or those plans for the future? that would attract students from underrepresented communities? Is there any outreach to specific undergraduate schools to encourage students from these underrepresented communities? It's a good question. Yeah, so David, there are um, currently recruiting strategies that, and, and contacts that we have, uh, as, as well as relationships that have been built with minority serving institutions, um, and schools which are part of our mission to attract students from. And so we have a, a targeted effort to work with some of those schools um, to encourage students to apply. Um, we've also done special sessions or workshops with schools or with societies that allow us to provide more insight, tips, tricks, to apply to RU programs. Um, and just, we, we know that not every student is going to have the same support when it comes to even letter writing recommendations that, are, that need to be submitted for, for students or essay writing. So anything that when, we, when we're invited to and anytime we can support some of those um, training skills on how to improve essays or how to to better apply to these programs, we like to do that. Um, and also to consider very equitable review processes so that we're not you know, necessarily looking just at merit or background alone. And then for the first part of your question, here's what the current. Here's what programs. The programs themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think, again, going back to helping students, preparing students for graduate school applications. We did a session last year on preparing for graduate school, um, writing, writing your essay, um, or there were, there were opportunities to do mock interviews for graduate school. It was kind of a pilot program that we ran and it was small attendance, but it was a great program. Um, also, the graduate school panel itself and the networking that allows students to better connect with faculty that they might want to work with or graduate school, um, uh, you know, graduate school recruiters. Um, additionally, we, we like to offer trainings and bioinformatics workshops. We have, we had some programming 
this summer that's available to anyone at BTI that has to do with um, inclusion and diversity. Uh, so there's there's a lot of programming that maybe we as a program you know, <laughs> coordinator don't put on ourselves, but allow students to participate in that are happening on campus. Um, yeah. But there's always, I think there's always room for, for uh, new programming and ways to update our program so that we continue to fulfill that mission of our funders. Sounds great. Um, there's one more question in the chat box. Uh, do you take applications from international undergraduates? Um, hi, Rob. So uh, we currently are unable to accept applications from students who are not US citizens or permanent residents of the United States. And that is a role that I didn't make. Uh, it's a role from the, the United States government. Um, and that is how our funding works. However, we are hopeful with the pandemic maybe easing and ending that we'll have some opportunities um, for some folks to participate in the site program, but not necessarily, they might not be funded by our, our, our current funders. So it's NSF and USDA requirements. Yes, those are NSF and USDA requirements, exactly. Okay, so there's potential for other funding for international students, theoretically? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, because research is very international. You know, I think one of the, one of the great uh, takeaways that a high school student had, and I will always remember this, is saying, one of my favorite parts of the summer was getting a chance to really understand all these different perspectives and work with with uh, mentors who were from all over the globe. She was saying that that was like one of her favorite parts of the summer because she had no idea how diverse um, our researchers are in, in plant science and in every field. And so I think it is really important to have that exposure as well as like some exposure to the fact that this summer we had someone talk a little bit about how you can do a, a postdoc in another country if you're a U.S. citizen. And so just like expanding and opening our participants um, and our undergraduate and high school students' minds to like how research works, how it's a global enterprise is, is really important. So the, the more participation we can have from people with different backgrounds is always, always welcome. Especially now with more and more becoming, you know, virtual or hybrid, you know, it's, it's getting easier to, to, to do cross-border research. Very nice. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. If anybody else out there has some questions, now's your chance. Um, is there anything else any of you three would like to say or ask each other? You can ask each other questions as well. The floor is open. <laughs> I did just want to say one thing. Um, You're talking about programming for uh, to target uh, participation for uh, underrepresented communities. Um, I remember I was able to go to a conference, um, ABRACAM, so this is the Annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students. It's a long title, but um, even though it's the Biomedical Research Conference, they still um, welcomed submissions for people, uh, from people that were in plant science. Um, and I was actually able to share some of the work that I did in White Tech's lab and I believe the funding, it was all funded. I didn't pay a cent to travel to Anaheim. Um, and I believe it came from the REU that you all sponsored a few students to go and share. And that was an incredible experience because I was able to talk about my experience in the lab with other students that looked just like me and had uh, very similar experiences um, within the lab setting and also like out in the real world, I guess. Um, so yeah, that was that's just another I guess program that, and it also I was able to talk with um, someone from Cornell about the plant biology program, and I have to say that uh, conversation was instrumental in my um, submission of an application to Cornell. So, just a little. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks for sharing that, Kaylin. I forgot that you did that. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. I didn't realize that you did that, Delaney, you send people. So, yes, yeah, so, so NSF um, will, 
it's not for, I don't think they have funding for everyone, but we have some supplemental funding that we can apply for if, if our participants want to go to conferences and present the work that they did at the, the summer before, typically is how, how, how the timing works out. So it is a really an amazing opportunity. And it honestly, I have to say that the, the continued the continue support from NSF um, is, is really so important to what we're doing. And I think it just really adds a lot of value to VTI and to Cornell and to the fact that, you know, Caitlin's a great example of being in our program. We were able to attract her to the program. She said yes and came and now she wanted to continue her career at Cornell. So I, I just, it, it's, it's all, it's all very fortunate and, um, you know, we're, we're very appreciative of the fact that we get to put this on every summer, this, this type of program. It's wonderful. I always look forward to it every summer. It's, it's a nice uh, injection of energy. Um, okay, well, thank you all out there for joining us today. And thank you again, Delaney Sickler, Kaylin Rayleigh, and Sadi Mohan Kumar for taking the time today to chat with us. And uh, thanks again to everyone out there who joined us. And please join us for BTI's next Breaking Ground discussion uh, on Wednesday, February 23rd with Dr. George Jander, uh, who was mentioned a few times today. He will be talking about his research designing viruses to defend against agricultural threats. And I'm going to put a bunch of links in the chat box for everyone, because I'm going to be um, uh, saying them. And if uh, uh, the next Breaking Ground is going to be great with George, uh, so please don't miss it. And you can go to btiscience.org for more information and to register. And you could read more about BTI's current research and many other neat stories about our science and programs like this one in our annual report, which you can find online at btiscience.org slash annual report. And BTI is an independent nonprofit research institute. And we operate in large part thanks to the generosity of community members like you all out there. And if you'd like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give or email our development team at development at btiscience.org. And thanks again, everyone, for your interest and support of the Boyce Thompson Institute. And have a wonderful day and be well. Bye, everyone.